I'm Elizabeth Sackler, and when we were talking about this panel, I kept calling it uh, Gen X, Gen Y, the next generation. And then somebody said it sounded like a Star Trek episode, and I figured that wasn't half bad <laughs> anyway. Um, I was going to ask with a full audience how many people were here who were in their 20s and who were in their 30s and 40s and 50s and so on. And I was thinking about this morning um, some of the benefits and the deficits of uh, chronological maturity. And I thought that um, one of the benefits to chronological maturity is being around long enough to have, or at least feel, that you have a sense of context for what is happening uh, in the moment. And that one of the deficits of chronological maturity, which is to say when you have gotten as old as you've gotten, um, one of the deficits is uh, having been around long enough to have, or at least feel you have, a sense of context. And I think that it is because of that deficit that we are, in fact, uh, here today. And I will address that a little bit more in a few minutes. As a human being, welcome. Some people having a seat. As a human being on uh, Spaceship Earth, I think it's a fair observation to note that what one sees in the context of a span of time in one's life probably is profoundly, enormously, and really outrageously, I think, changed every 50 years. So for each generation in between or 50 years hence, our context of which we understand our present time is incredibly, incredibly different. I recall my mother uh, complaining, it's not the way it used to be. And I came of age in the 60s, and as you can imagine, um, even having the most radical of parents, which I'm pleased I did, actually, um, they were unhappy about uh, the sloppiness of dress, and that was before jeans. They were uh, upset about the sloppiness of speech with the onset of cool man and so on. And of course, I find myself complaining, as my son who is here today will attest to, about like. Like, you know what I mean. And of course, there was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And I think the older generation uh, had a little bit of a hard time with that. I can attest to the fact that there was nothing to have a hard time about. But um, having lived in the 60s, we also lived during a very successful militant activism in civil rights, anti-nuclear marches, protests against the Vietnam War, uh, and of course the women's revolution which began in the 1970s. And it was a field day for change. But the means towards the end was on target at that time. The form and the rage and the problems were cohesive. The form worked, the rage was present, and the effects were evident. Uh, telephones were connected by cords. Televisions were mostly black and white and movies were only in the theater. And those were our technological advances um, that we enjoyed in our teens and in our 20s. It was another world, obviously, I think. It was another lifetime. And in this moment and in this life, we're living at the crossroads. I really do believe we are at the crossroads of our emancipation yardstick. The power of our country's demographic is significantly altered over the last 50 years. The cultural landscape over the last 50 years has changed. 
and technological advancement, obviously, is beyond whatever our imaginations could possibly have dreamed up and probably is the most democratic part of this country at this time. One year ago, um, the Ms. Foundation and Executive Director Sarah Gould, who is with us here today, um, put together a meeting. I like to think of it as a think tank. There were about 12 of us, and only one person at the table was um, under 40. And it was an exciting uh, afternoon. It was thoughtful, it was of concern, but there were too many gripes from the gray hairs of us uh, that we were reinventing the wheel, that we discussed this. I don't think I was one of those voices, but I'm just reporting that we discussed this years ago, that um, no younger women are activists, no younger women are feminists, and so on and so forth. And our moderator today, Sharna Goldsecker, clearly and simply stated at, the, at one point when somebody had said something fairly outrageous, I think, that is not true, she said. And I think uh, all of you here today, our panelists, are the exclamation point, at least for me they are, of the statement of that fact. Um, Sharna responded to my invitation for a couple of lunches together, and they were informative and exciting, I think, for each of us. And we invited Sarah Gould, who, to join the conversation, and then the three of us decided to grow exponentially, and we did. We have had seven meetings with no agenda. We're now, I like to think of us as the dirty dozen, and, um, or the women who lunch. We always go to my office and have lunch, and I decided all of us who work very, very hard, we're now suddenly women who lunch. They've been wonderful meetings that have include, included uh, me, Sharna, Sarah, Olivia Greer, who is with us here today, Amy Sanenman, who's with Groundswell Community Mural Project, its founder and director, Monique Mehta of the Third Wave Foundation, Liz Abzug of the Abzug Consulting Services, and daughter of the great and wonderful Bella Abzug, Benita Miller Johnston, uh, Johnson, excuse me, who's Brooklyn Young Mothers Collective, Nicole Mason, National Council for Research on Women, Malia Lazu, The Gathering Project, Lala Wu, who is a law student, Laura Walker, who's president of WNYC, and Carol Jenkins, also with us here today, who's the head of the Women's Media Center. And so it's, it's a great uh, and wonderful group. The majority of women in this group are uh, under 35. And so for the four of us who are way over 35, it has been a tremendous opportunity to hear and understand and begin to be educated about what's going on. We have discussed issues and problems, of course, but we have also discussed vocabulary and language. We've discussed categories and passions and different foci. And I think um, one of the things I've come away from, and perhaps we'll hear a little bit about that today, I don't know is that um, the vocabulary may be different. The same way that we have a cell phone instead of a corded phone, and the same way that we have instantaneous email instead of a black and white television, we may have a different vocabulary for what may be the same um, passion and thrust for equality and justice, and to try and find a way to better our social uh, our social landscape. So, as a group, a sturdy dozen women who lunch reached a consensus to um, try and transcend these divides, these generational divides, and to move into some kind of solidarity. And we haven't really come up yet with a mission statement, which we're going to be working on. And we haven't come up with a program, but we decided before too much time went by that we really wanted to begin, and so today is the beginning of uh, what we don't know, and it may seem like a spit in the bucket, but we're all very determined to hear from all of you. 
uh, a panel which Sharna has put together to hear about your activism, your passions, your work, the vocabularies, your commitments. And uh, I made a little note here, which I guess I just have to read. I am compelled that a woman may not be running for president this year, but the door must be kept wide open. The backlash I think we have seen, are seeing is, is already begun, and we need to hold our place and uh, continue our work, and we need to do that in solidarity as women of all generations. And I hope that all of the things that we all do continue to move us towards uh, the places that we want to be. So with that, uh, my pleasure is to introduce you to our moderator, Sharna Goldsecker, who is Vice President of the Andrea and Charles Bronfman Philanthropies, where she directs 2164, a, a division specializing in next generation and multi-generational strategic philanthropy. In that capacity, Sharna manages Grand Street, a network for 18 to 28 year olds who will be involved in their family's philanthropy or who are already involved. She develops philanthropic tools including Slingshot, a resource guide to Jewish innovation, which is online, all of this is online, everything's online, the world is wild and wonderful, and speaks and consults on multi-generational philanthropy with families, foundations, federations, and families. She's a graduate uh, from Pe uh, University of Pennsylvania and major, with a major in urban studies and religious studies and a master's in public administration from New York University's Robert F. Wagner School of Public Service. She has additional training in organizational development and group dynamics. She has a, put together an extremely wonderful panel for us today. I am delighted. Please, Sharna, introduce them and welcome, and I thank you very much for having put this together. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. You're welcome. <clears throat> really warm thanks to Elizabeth, both for the inspiring introduction, but for inviting us to have this conversation at the uh, Brooklyn Museum of Art and for the intellectual space you've created at the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. Um, an additional thanks to Sarah Gould, our co-sponsor from the Ms. Foundation for Women, and to all of you who are here today. Um, I know it's a beautiful sunny day outside, so if you're here it means you want to be here for this conversation and we're delighted to have it with you. If you're uh, watching this on video and joining us for the conversation at another time, we'll try to keep the noise down from the crowds up in the balcony and uh, invite you to, to engage in it with people in your own living room at a later time. Um, I just want to underscore three things that Elizabeth said that are the um, motivations for me in this panel. I like to sort of state up front the underlying premise and how I organize a panel. So um, for one, as Elizabeth said, it's an opportunity to hear the voices of next generation women, Gen X and Gen Y, and to know loud and clearly that we are here and involved as women activists leading in, uh, in our communities. Um, secondly, women leaders aren't necessarily just at women's organizations anymore, but as you'll see from our panelists, are involved in a wide variety of social and economic justice issues. And then thirdly, um, there are four generations as the invitation states, Gen Y, Gen X, baby boomers, and traditionalists who are all working in the same communal space right now. Um, and really each was informed uh, by different historic social economic circumstances that created sort of a generational personality for each. And so how do we come to understand the generational personalities of each of those four generations, Gen X and Gen Y, up here today? And hopefully you'll add your voices to the conversation for those of you who are in the room. But really, to learn from each other how we can work on issues together, because we know that the issues are larger than each of our generational cohorts. So hopefully, uh, the third outcome will be learning some strategies for how we can bridge those generational divides. Um, the way this is going to work is I'll introduce our panelists, invite them to say some opening remarks. Um, I'll add a series of questions to sort of dig deeper into the issues and then invite you to add your questions and comments and we'll have a roving microphone. So um, don't hesitate to jot things down as we're speaking and we'll invite you to join the conversation shortly. 
So um, over here is Ai Jen Pu, who is the lead organizer with Domestic Workers United, an organization of Caribbean, Latina, and African nannies, housekeepers, and elderly caregivers in New York, organizing for power, respect, and fair labor <laughs> standards. She's also the associate director of CAV, organizing Asian communities, and has been organizing with immigrant women workers since 1996. To her right, we have Olivia Greer, an associate producer at The Culture Project, a New York theater company, producing work with contemporary political issues. Her capacity there is artistic director, Women's Center Stage, an annual festival celebrating women artists whose work give voice to human struggles globally. And most recently, Olivia founded Emancipate, an initiative bringing together women musicians and activists, amplifying social justice issues through their musical collaborations. Over here we have Malia Lazou, the director of the Gathering Project for Justice, an intergenerational and intercultural space to allow the justice community in the broadest sense, um, mostly younger activists, to get to know one another, find a common agenda, and have tools um, to further their work and prevent incarceration. Um, Malia was previously the director of the Racial Justice Campaign Fund, a progressive majority, as well as the National Field Director for Cities for Progress. And lastly, to my left, we have Kyung Ri, or KJ, if that's okay to call you that on the panel, is the director of the Prison Moratorium Project, focusing on juvenile justice. Its mission is to affect juvenile justice system reform, uh, reduce incarceration rates for people of color, and we'll hear um, hopefully more from all of you momentarily. Really, I would love to, uh, I know these bios sort of capture our titles, but invite you all to take that one step further and tell us how you see the work and also if you could add what motivates you. How did you come to the work that you do today? Maybe Ai-Jen, we'll start with you. Sure. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sharna. It's great to be here with all of you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, it's a beautiful day and there's nowhere I'd rather be. I just want to say that. Um, and thanks to the Brooklyn Museum and the co-sponsors of this really great dialogue. Um, so I am an organizer with Domestic Workers United, as Sharna said, and we are an organization of 2,000 nannies, housekeepers, and elderly caregivers. And uh, we live in a city here in, in New York um, where over 200,000 women every day get up uh, three hours before most of us other folks do um, and go to work in other people's homes to make it possible for those people to then go to work and do what they do. Um, and that work is, plays a really important role in this economy here in New York, but we rarely think about it and we rarely account for it. Um, and in fact, the laws that exist um, don't even recognize this workforce as a real workforce. So labor laws actually exclude domestic workers. Almost every single labor law actually excludes domestic workers, with the exception of minimum wage laws. So the National Labor Relations Act that gives workers the right to collectively bargain and form a union excludes domestic workers. Um, the uh, occupational safety and health laws exclude domestic workers. Civil rights, anti-discrimination laws, and human rights laws don't apply to domestic workers. So you have a situation where there's an enormous workforce of women who are doing critical work, and most of whom are primary income earners for their families. 51% um, are primary income earners for their families. And they're completely vulnerable to abuse so if they happen to find a good employer, then they're actually, there's a good chance that they might get a few days off or the opportunity to go to their own children's PTA meeting. But the vast majority of people actually don't have that situation or are vulnerable to different kinds of abuses because a lot of employers of domestic workers don't actually think of themselves as employers and they might even think of themselves as employees themselves and aren't aware that there's actually a, a set of guidelines and obligations that you have as an employer. So what you have is a situation where women are working 13, 14 hour days, some are living in, in their employers' homes um, with no job security, no health care, often for below minimum wage, um, no time off, 
to see the doctor. Um, a lot of people who call in sick um, risk losing their jobs for actually calling in sick. So it's a choice between actually going to work or having a job and going to take care of your own health. Um, which is particularly challenging when you're taking care of kids, and kids actually often carry a lot of um, sicknesses. And so they often get sick from the kids that they take care of, but then can't take care of their own health. So there's, a, there's a, a, a systemic problem in this industry where you've got an enormous workforce of, of women who are not protected, who are not recognized, and who are not, who are, whose work is being undervalued. And so what we do at Domestic Workers United is through organizing and bringing people together in an organization, establishing courses and training programs for people to develop, to understand their rights and exercise their rights and develop their leadership and their ability to organize other domestic workers. And through actually organizing campaigns that change the conditions that workers deal with every day, um, for example, right now we're working on a campaign for a domestic workers bill of rights in New York, which would establish labor protections for domestic workers for the first time in this country, in any state, including health care, uh, sick days, notice and severance pay, protection from discrimination, um, basic rights for workers that otherwise could never be negotiated by a worker on her own. Um, we're trying to uh, enact a law that would actually put these protections into place in the laws. Um, so that's what we're working on right now. And through the organizing and bringing people together, we've been successful in winning over half a million dollars in unpaid wages for domestic workers who've been underpaid by their employers. We've graduated over 450 nannies from our nanny training program um, who are now trained in infant child CPR as well as know how to negotiate for their rights and, and uh, make sure that they're uh, being respected and, and treated with dignity. And we're continuing to work to build this movement in this workforce um, all over the country. We're working together with other organizations that are organizing domestic workers and we've actually formed a national alliance of domestic workers and we're going to be meeting here in New York next week. So it's actually a really exciting time for this work that's happening and um, we've got a growing workforce of feminists that we're actually developing. Um, people who are bringing dignity and value to the work that has been traditionally associated with women's work, um, work that women do to actually care for and raise every generation. Um, bringing dignity and recognition to that work is something that touches everybody and I think that that's much of the uh, inspiration for, for me personally for why I'm involved in this work and what drives me is that when we have a world where all work is recognized and respected. It's going to be a world that looks very different from the world that we have today. And I think it's going to be a world that also has a, taken on and addressed some of the root causes of why there's inequality and injustice today. Um, and the work that women do in the home has never been recognized or protected, whether it was um, as a, whether it was the work of my mother or my grandmother or the work that domestic workers do in the home. And so that work, um, bringing respect and recognition to that work was something that I always thought about growing up. And I think that um, talking to my mother, it really inspired me to want to continue to do this work and also see the way that it's connected to domestic violence in the home and other forms of injustice that we see. Um, and I'm going to stop there and maybe pick it up in the, in the question and answer, but just Perfect. intro. Thank you. <laughs> Livia, maybe we can turn it over to you. Sure. I need my microphone. Hi. Um, so my name is Olivia Greer. I'm a, an associate producer at Culture Project, which is a theater company in Soho that presents work that's focused on um, issues of social justice. And I came to that work um, through sort of a trajectory of being an artist myself and also being really interested in how the arts play a role in social justice activism. 
Um, so I, I, my work at Culture Project is primarily directing a festival called Women Center Stage, which works to um, bring together women artists who are engaged in questions of social justice through their work. Um, and I come to that for, for two specific reasons, I think. The first is the awareness that um, women continue to be underrepresented in all industries. So I think in theater right now, the numbers are something like of the plays that get produced in America every year, 22% are by women. And the numbers are even less for directors and designers and stage managers. So we're talking about an arena which, you know, in some ways is not seen as um, uh, an area for social justice, um, but still faces the same kind of inequality that, that anything does, that banking does, that, um, you know, any industry that we might find does. So that's one piece of it. And then the second piece um, is that in every movement for change, I think that we can remember that has basically existed throughout human history, women have been um, major, major leaders of that change and often in unrecognized uh, ways. And so for us, the work at Women's Center Stage is about both drawing attention to the issues through the art and also locating women as agents of change in that work. Um, so, so we try and bring together these women artists and activists to talk about the work that they do and to think together about how to advance that work. Um, and I found it emancipates, which is um, sort of another step beyond what we do at Women's Center Stage with the question of, of how the arts can actually create tangible change. So oftentimes we see a play, we go and see some music that is about a social justice issue and we learn about that issue, but how do artists actually get involved in the work of change? And so Emancipate is bringing together women artists um, to actually go into communities and find ways of supporting the work that's already happening. So we began this year in New Orleans bringing a coalition of six women artists from around the country to New Orleans to um, spend time together meeting with community organizers and think about how they could make a difference in that city. Um, and what happened was that they were all inspired to create new work. Um, they all wrote new songs. And this fall, we'll be going back to New Orleans to record those songs um, and produce a CD, all the proceeds of which will go to community organizations in New Orleans. Um, so there's this sort of new model that we're trying to uh, advance, which is about finding ways to use artistic work um, to create really tangible means of change. Um, so I can say more about that later, but I guess on the personal side, um, for me this is all about sort of having a sense of myself uh, both as an artist and as an actor in the world um, and looking to find ways of, of bringing those two things together um, and looking for the ways in which our culture, you know, our art um, is very much engaged in the issues that we face so that it's not something that we go to to escape. It's really something that we go to to find ways of digging in and understanding better and engaging one another. Thank you. <laughs> so Malia, I would love to hear more about your work and what motivates you to do it. Absolutely. Um, First of all, I just want to say that I'm really thankful that we're having this discussion. I think that we're in, a, that our society needs to go through a paradigm shift. And if we don't have honest dialogue about what that looks like and what that means, um, we're not going to be the ones that are going to be forming the next, um, the next shift that we're going into. And I think that's going to be detrimental to the progressive movement and radical thought as a whole. Um, so conversations like this are really, really important for us to get into. Um, the organization that I work for currently is called The Gathering for Justice, and it was an organization that really emerged um, out of a couple years of going throughout the country and meeting with young people and with civil rights activists um, of all sorts. Um, the organization's vision came from a gentleman by the name of Harry Belafonte, um, who is a singer, actor, activist, and came home from South Africa and saw a, the image of a five-year-old girl being arrested in school, she was being thrown over her desk. Um, the cops were putting, there were four police officers, they were putting handcuffs on her. Um, when the handcuffs didn't fit, they got the twist ties um, because she was, you know, at 
60 pounds, she's so dangerous. Um, and they um, handcuffed her, shackled her, put her into the car, brought her down to the police station, started to charge her, and then came to find out that what she was being charged with, being unruly in the school, is actually not against the law. And so this poor child was put through all of that trauma to just be released. And Mr. Belafonte called me and said, you know, I just saw this, find out more information, find out where the protest is, find out where the rally is, you know, find out where the movement is behind protecting this child and let them know that I will be there. Um, I called St. Petersburg to find out that there was no protest, there was no rally, there was no movement to protect this child. And as a matter of fact, she was one of 15,000 under the age of nine um, of children who are being put through this system. And as we started doing more research, what we came to find is that it's not that there's no one out there doing this work. There are amazing organizations out there that are ringing the alarm for us to realize what is going on with our children. And what Mr. Belafonte saw was that the criminal justice system, the juvenile justice system, is our modern day Jim Crow. And that it is essential that we use radical thinking, radical organizing, but more importantly, that we apply nonviolent direct action to raise the level of civic tension and to support the groups on the ground that are doing this work. Um, he called together a gathering of the elders. I like to say it was everyone who's in a Taylor Branch book who's still alive came. And they talked about how to reclaim their children. And what became very evident, very similar to our opening remarks here today, was that we were talking past one another. And that the mistrust, the feeling of abandonment that a lot of our young people felt um, was something that we needed to work through. And so that's the work that we do. We create this space, we allow for emergence, we're a decentralized structure, we're a true movement. We like to say that we're a fractal. You know, oftentimes people are like, oh, well, don't we all have to have the same thing and be doing the same thing at the same time and da da da. And when you really start, to, especially when you start talking to the elders, you know, what, whatever area they were organizing was the centerpiece of the civil rights movement. Um, and you realize that everything was the centerpiece of the civil rights movement. What was going on in Mississippi was a centerpiece of the civil rights movement. What was going on in Selma was a piece of the civil rights movement. What was going on in Chicago was a piece of the civil rights movement. And when you, when you took a step back, that's when you begin to see the, the shift and the wave. Um, and so we allow our young people to create their own agendas and we give them the, the support um, in being able to see those agendas through. We also do a lot of model exchange. So KJ, um, who's gonna be telling you about the amazing work that she does, Wherever we go, we're talking about prison moratorium project. They're doing some of the most advanced work um, in the country in this area. And so when we travel around, you know, we take KJ, we take Chino, um, and and make sure that our young people hear from these models that are working, so that they can also learn how to apply them. Um, I want to end my comments by really addressing this idea of activism in the twenty um, in the twenty first century. And I want to end by by where I began, which was talking about this paradigm shift. As we know, um, you know, in a couple of decades, this country is going to be a majority minority country. And that's really important for us to recognize. It's important for us to recognize because of the cultural changes. But we also need to recognize what technology has done to, to this country um, and, how it's, and how it's imperative that we start deconstructing our normal sort of demographic check boxes, you know, so the idea of like hip hop black people, you know, like um, white people like this, like the hottest skateboarder out right now is a black kid from Compton. And what technology has allowed us to do is it's allowed us to build a culture that is no longer based on where I am demographically because I can access so much on the web. And I think that that's something that we want to remember when we're reaching out to, to young people and when we're looking at doing organizing in the 21st century is that we can no longer do it traditionally. Um, we can no longer think that certain stereotypes are fitting. We have to understand that young people are coming together in networks, building friendships that to them are very real with people halfway across the world with whom they've never met in person. And it's those types of shifts um, that we need to really get in front of and stand on stand on the edge um, and on you know and on the edge of, of movement and look out to see um, how we get in front of the eight ball on this one. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> KJ, a little bit about your work and what motivates you to do it. Hello everybody. Is this working? Yeah. No. That's nice. <laughs> 
Um, so I too want to, I mean, it's an honor to be part of this panel and to be part of this space, especially in light of um, Elizabeth's um, introduction. I feel like we're very much, um, you know, we're, we're part of kind of an emerging um, and uh, emerging initiative that also is like vision be, being born and, and being implemented. And, and that's always exciting to be kind of at the beginning stages of things. Um, uh, I'm going to start out, so I'm with an organization called the Prison Moratorium Project. It's a mouthful. Um, and I'll just put it out there. Our street name is No More Prisons. And, uh, and I'll get into, you know, what do you mean by No More Prisons? The 10 million questions that follow No More Prisons whenever I give out our website address. Um, so let me start out with a little bit of history. Uh, Prison Moratorium Project started really as a vision and an idea. Um, inside the prison system, specifically inside the Green Haven Correctional Facility, which is a maximum prison in upstate New York, um, back in the 80s, where um, following, uh, where a group called Green Haven Think Tank formed inside Green Haven Correctional Facility. This followed as a result of, or as inspired by, I don't know, I don't know if some of you know, I'm just going to briefly mention in the 70s there was a major um, rebellion and organizing that happened inside the Attica prison um, where a lot of death, violence, um, and, uh, and, and conflict took place and a lot of debates around that. But the main point that I want to convey there is it really changed um, I think the, the landscape and kind of um, when Malia talked about paradigm shift, thinking about the prison system and the prison issues changed a lot in light of and following the Attica Rebellion, the coverage and whatnot. You had prisoners who organized to fight for basic dignity and basic rights and basic conditions of human livelihood inside the prison system. So you were, and you could imagine being on lockdown the kind of different circumstances and, 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 and conditions under which they kind of came about and did that. But following that, um, there were basic rights. One, you're talking about to toilet paper, you're talking about um, decent food, um, you're talking about um, health care, you're talking about um, library, um, law library and different basic rights. Following that event, a lot of different um, groups formed in different uh, facilities and a lot of uh, folks from Attica prison were dispersed and some of them came to Greenhaven Correctional Facility and formed this think tank where really the primary focus was there's a lot of resources and wisdom to be shared here and let's help each other um, with the learned experiences that we have and that at the end of the day we need to be able to advocate for ourselves rather than depending on however best intention different advocates or whatnot in terms of how do you how do you um, present your case in front of the parole board to how do you access resources outside for when you get out, all this stuff. In the course of that dialogue, coming out of some basic kind of resource sharing, they started recognizing, right, amongst themselves that vast majority of the prisons are upstate, by the way, right? That vast majority of the prisoners inside the prison system and inside this prison, and, you know, people move around a lot. Prisoners are shipped from, you know, Prisoners are, prisoners are moved from one facility to another. As they, they started to notice a pattern that really vast majority of them came from seven to 10 neighborhoods in New York City, okay? So then that actually gave rise to a seminal study that they did in cooperation with different researchers that, what, 20 years after now is still cited and has given, given, has given impetus and rise to other studies um, um, also in the juvenile justice realm, which I'll get into later. So that's how it was born in terms of what is going on here in our communities that we're looking at seven to 10 neighborhoods. How is this happening? Following the dialogue, they basically started to form, um, they started to initiate a series of legislative hearings inside the prison system, calling for a prison moratorium. The vision call out was pretty, pretty um, stark and simple in the beginning. Let's call for a moratorium for five years on prison construction. Because you've got to understand at this point in the 80s, I can give you some numbers right now in 2008 what it looks like in terms of the prison system in the US and also in terms of the world standing. But these trends and these findings were already present 
and prominent in the 80s. When they started putting together the legislative hearings, just calling for a five-year moratorium on prison construction, and what if we just rerouted those funds, right? What if we could just envision rerouting those funds that would go to prison construction, which was mammoth amount of money, to the communities where most of the prisoners come from? And that was their way of calling attention to the issues that exist in the communities with highest rates of incarceration. They actually called the legislators inside the prison system every year. It was a yearly legislative forum. That's how it began in terms of um, calling attention to and really kind of putting the paradigm shift in terms of how to think about prison issues. Because to date, you're really only thinking about it in terms of prison conditions, prisoners' rights. That was kind of the best case scenario. And really thinking about, um, really taking the issue to how is this a social justice issue. And even among the left activists, you gotta understand, prison issue was the pariah issue, right? Why don't you work on something more positive, right? Like education rights, reproductive rights, uh, welfare reform. Why are you working on prison issues? Those are criminals, so to speak. So one of the biggest challenges in the beginning was even amongst the left, even amongst kind of the liberal progressives, how to really re reimagine and re understand prison issue as a social justice issue. So following that founding, um, one of the members of Greenhaven Think Tank um, who was uh, uh, critical in forming that, uh, writing that study that I told you about in terms of seven to 10 neighborhoods, is, his name is Eddie Ellis. And when he got out of the prison system, he formed alliances with different allies outside and came to form what is now known as the Prison Moratorium Project. And over the years, kind of fast forward to now, um, it's gone through a lot of different uh, phases. In 1995, it formed officially as a volunteer organization. We started getting funding from foundations in 2000, pretty much. And in 2008, we kind of come full circle. Eddie Ellis, who was the founder back in the 80s, who, you know, from the vision born, brought it outside and formed this, helped to kind of form this organization. He's now at Mecca Evers College, um, head of a center called Center for New Leadership on Urban Solutions. Um, we have in the last 10 years kind of moved the organization from the mission of stopping prison expansion and construction and looking at the larger issues to we have really been focusing on juvenile justice issues in the last seven to eight years by virtue of the kind of young activists that came into the organization. And now we're going back to, um, we've formed partnership with Eddie Ellis and we're going to be now uh, located at McGrevers College in partnership with Eddie Ellis. So there's going to be an intergenerational as well as an institutional kind of marriage between the two. But the, having said that, I kind of went on about the history, um, but the organizational strategy obviously Whenever we talk about this, everyone asks, well, how, do you, how do you do that? How do you do no more prisons? How do you stop prison expansion? Or how do you take on the prison system, which is so gigantic? Um, and just on that note, in terms of the scope and scale of the prison system, I imagine most of you know this, but I'll just put out some just quick uh, stats. United States of America has the fastest and highest rate of incarceration in the world. So what that, that lands us at a prison population of two million people behind bars right now. And it's projected to go up in the next five to 10 years. Now, two million people locked up behind bars, that's not taking into account 4.6 additional million people who are under the supervision of probation or parole. So you're talking about about seven million people under this supervision of the criminal justice system. So now when you look at the kind of whys, there's a lot of whys that we could go into, but one thing that I would put out there, statistically, studies, of, studies upon studies have come out, up, uh, come out with this, is it's really not, the first thing you're gonna say, uh, first thing most people say is it's the crime rates, right? Well, we must be building more prisons because there's an increasing crime rate. In fact, what's been, driven, what's been driving the prison population and prison expansion is the policies rather than actually the crime rate. Crime rate actually has been going down in the last 10 years. Now, depending on what kind of crime index you look at, you're gonna find variation. But overall, crime rate has been going down. What has been driving the population is longer sentencing laws and everything from quality of life crimes being enforced as well as, um, as, well as harsher sentencing overall. So that's really the policy and the practice is what's really been driving the system. 
Having said that, when we say no more prisons, and in terms of our organization, our strategy falls into three areas. No more prisons as in stopping the prison system from expanding. And we are talking about the prison system, the prison cells, whatnot. So an example of that, that's one line in which we work. So what we see as that strategy is what we call system reduction and system accountability. So an example of that in New York City, about six years ago, under, um, seven years ago, or eight years ago, under Giuliani's administration, there was $64.6 .6 million allotted in the capital budget of the city to expand two juvenile detention facilities in this city. There's three. So two out of three by $65 million. Just to give you a little bit of funding priority, that breaks down to $65 million for 200 jail cells expansion. That breaks down to $320,000 per jail cell just for construction cost. That doesn't include the 200, over $200,000 a year that Department of Juvenile Justice spends just in operation cost. Okay, back then it was 130,000, now it's $200,000, right? How many kids can you send to Harvard on $200,000 a year, right? So when you start thinking about that scale, when, that, when we found out about the $65 million in the budget for 200 jail cell expansion, 100 jails in the Bronx, 100 jail cells in Brooklyn, all the capacities at that time were under capacity. They weren't even full. So when we challenged Department of Juvenile Justice and did, had to do all this research in terms of how they're going to justify this, their first, their first line of defense was it's based on population projection. So when you're at 70% capacity, rather than looking at how can we keep this and lower it, they are actually in the business of projecting population swell, okay, in terms of certain types times of the year. Uh, obviously not a very solid basis and we were able to beat them after a year of organizing um, under the rubric of Justice for Youth Coalition and No More Youth Jails campaign. We basically sapped their budget and, and pulled the money out of their uh, capital budget um, with a lot of um, organizing that was done by actually formerly incarcerated youth um, who were intensely trained. So that's one way in which we fight the system, right? Doing, going into the policies and, and bringing accountability to system expansion that we're so um, we've been so conditioned to just accept and it's become normalized. On another level, when we say no more prisons, we're talking about the prison conditions that exist in communities and also amongst us, kind of the prison mentality that our society has developed over the last 30 years of this mammoth system expansion. So then on a community level, we are working in 15 communities with the highest rates of juvenile incarceration rate. Um, and and then the third level at which we kind of draw on no more prisons um, strategy is on a personal level. It's the call out for no more prisons for you and me, for a lot of young people directly affected by the prison system, for a lot of young people coming from the neighborhoods. Um, how do you bring the kind of personal accountability? How do you bring that sense of how do you start addressing what we call three eyes of oppression? institutional, and interpersonal, and in internalized oppression, which is what we break down through our curriculum, what that is. So that's kind of our overall organizational strategy, and we can get into specifics of that, of that later. Um, and as question and answer comes, um, and right now we're in the process of, it's an interesting story, we're in the process of going into the three juvenile detention facilities. Um, and we actually have a contract with Department of Juvenile Justice, which is interesting because we, we very much fought them hard six years ago and they brought us in and I can tell you many stories about that right now, how that dynamic is playing out. Um, but how I came to this work personally um, is a lot, as all of us have a lot of encounters, but um, I, I would say, I would mention two main things. My cousin was locked up. My cousin who I didn't know I had until I was 16 years old. Um, uh, was locked up and was involved in a gang, was a gang leader. Um, and just in terms of how that was processed um, within my family um, and how it was um, and stigmatized both on a societal level and internally in our family, um, that also brought me primarily to this work and going, and going forward as I also studied philosophy and ethics and it also fell in line with other larger values. Thank you. So you've all laid out a lot of um, inequality and injustice that you're working on through different vehicles. Um, Malia, I wanted to start some questions with you. You mentioned paradigm shift, and what I always like to remember about paradigm shift is, is where 
moving forward into a new paradigm, we've come from somewhere, mm -hmm. right? And there's actually the turmoil between the two paradigms um, that we need to go through. So t how, how do you anchor yourself in the past paradigm? Like what are the social movements? Who are the elders? What are the lessons learned that you draw on as we're going through this period of change? Definitely. Um, you know, I think that when we, when we talk about how are we anchored and in the Gathering for Justice, we use a term called elder and it actually comes from the Lakota tribe and the indigenous peoples. Um, when we traveled around the country, we went to Epps, Alabama to work with the rural, um, rural Southern blacks. We went, with, we went to Santa Cruz to work with Barrio Shumitos um, and get to know the Latino um, history and their current movements. We went to Appalachia to work with the working class whites. Um, we went to Onondaga Indian um, Nation. Mm -hmm. And then we went to LA County um, to work with the Asian Pacific Islander group. And when we were in Onondaga, we learned something really, really important, which was this term elder. And the term elder can only, um, is not applied to every person of old age. And the term elder actually means listener. And that's how they deem elders. And we all kind of started to laugh because we were like, our elders don't shut up. Like, we need to get them on this. And what we realized was that there, that, that, was a cultural shift and we really try to anchor ourselves in first and foremost recognizing and um and honoring our elders and we do it at every circle at every gathering we do but then we also recognize that space of you know allowance for paradigm shifts and it's it's helpful um when you can bring folks from you know different cultures who understand generations in a different way than than we made in america and so what I do personally um, is I'm actually a big fan of history, and so I read a lot and, um, and try to find you know, roads that, that have been taken, so I'm not reinventing the wheel. And um, organizationally, as I said, we try to put young people with our elders as much as possible so that they can start seeing each other's humanity and they can start building um, off of each other's humanity. Um, and a quick story, and, and, then, um, and, and then I'll shut up. Um, is when we were at the African American Democratic National Committee meeting in Detroit, um, in Detroit, Michigan, a couple years back. And it was this intergenerational panel, and it was Al Sharpton, it was Reverend Jesse Jackson, um, it was Reverend Steele, um, and it was a couple other elders, I think John Conyers, and then it was a group of young people, myself, Reverend Toon, Tracy Sturdiv, and just some of the most amazing um, organizers in electoral politics. And Al Sharpton, you know, Jesse Jackson, you can imagine the only person that was missing was Fidel, and I'd still be there listening to speeches. Um, and so, of course, they went on over, and then when they were done, they got up and they started leaving. I mean, literally walking around the young people um, and started leaving. And it was this, it was this sort of like um, th this moment of all of us in, in the young people just being so insulted and, and not even so much that we had to sit there for three hours um, to listen to the amazing knowledge um, that, that our elders have, but that they weren't willing to give us the final 45 minutes um, of the day to, to hear us. And I think that's something that, that we want to remember um, and when we're looking at this paradigm shift and how we're going to anchor it is that we do need to learn the lessons um, from our elders and they need to be taught um, not we don't just need to be spoken at and I think that that's something that's really really important and with the shifts in technology I mean it's very similar to you know the radio or, or the telephone I mean we have a new mode of transportation and what we need our elders to do is to hear what it is that we're trying to do and to apply their knowledge and their experience of, of changing the world to these new tools um, th that we have. Awesome. So Olivia, if you want to pick up, you know, I think about um, the anthropologist Margaret Mead talks about have to understand the cultures of the past and also the people of the present that are peers who are around us before we can start planning for the future. Do you want to talk about some of either the, the people in the past, women or men that have inspired you or your peers who are informing your work? Yeah. Um, so. This is maybe coming around things from the side, but um, I think, you know, I, I didn't, I'm 27, so I, I don't think I knew I was a feminist until maybe the 2000. 
and I think, and, and largely because I think my first feminist teacher was my dad. So like I grew up in this family where the idea that women were equal to men was just went without saying. I mean, it was sort of assumed and there were, there seemed to me to be larger social justice issues to be addressed because in my very limited bubble of a world, um, that was not an issue. It simply wasn't. And so I think it took me some time to identify questions of feminism and questions of gender equality. Um, and that came through uh, meeting organizers um, who were working on other issues that um, who, who came to it from a lens that included feminism. So reading Angela Davis, Women, Race, and Class was this aha moment of, you know, wow, there's this whole agenda about civil rights and human rights and equality that includes women and is not only about women, because if we're fighting for justice for everyone, we're fighting for justice for everyone, right? Not, you know. So um, that's by way of saying, I think that um, uh, for me, the big awakening was was that I was very privileged. You know, as a young white woman growing up in New York, I didn't have to worry about feminism, um, and so it took me some real time to find the history of that and sort of understand the roots of of the feminist movement and also why younger women of my generation don't necessarily identify with the word with the movement. Um, and so that's been a really interesting and challenging journey for me, particularly since my work is very focused on women who are activists and artists. Um, so I would, I would cite Angela Davis in a big way as, as someone who really sort of helped craft that understanding for me. Um, there are two other pieces which I was gonna mention. One is that um, there was a sort of an, a cute anecdote. I. Um, when I was 16, was part of Union Summer, which none of you are allowed to actually tell because I was too young to really be a part of Union <laughs> Summer. I was tagging along with my big brother. And so we were in South Carolina um, organizing hotel workers on Hilton Head Island who were mostly African-American women being bussed in to these plantations, right, to, to do the laundry and to clean these hotels. Um, and most of the kids who were part of Union Summer were college students, and I was like a sophomore in high school, and I thought they were awesome, and you know, stayed up late debating theory of movements and things like that. And there was this one guy who, I don't remember his name, but he was just the quintessential macho organizer, like had no interest in women, felt like they should really stay at home, had you know just was was very very dismissive and it was you know late one night and he was saying some stupid things and the younger women were getting more and more upset and my my brother who was you know this labor organizer hero of mine um sat him down and and basically explained to him in the kindest way possible that if he was going to be an organizer and if he was going to work on behalf of justice for these hotel workers he couldn't leave the women out and, and it was a moment for him and it was a moment for me. Um, and so I think from, from that moment on, I've really carried with me the notion that feminism is integral to any activism that we encounter. Um, just as I would think that um, you know, anti-racism work is integral to any activism that we would encounter and the right for a woman to choose what she does with her body is integral to any kind of activism that we would encounter. Um, so I think I draw from, from all of those movement leaders uh, who teach us that. Um, and then the last thing is, is just to sort of name some people. I think Eve Ensler is someone I look to a lot in my work um, for melding the art and the activism piece and for sort of having this global scope um, and understanding about what women struggle with in the context that they live in. So it's not just that they are the victims of sexism, but that they live in the Congo and that they have no clean water and their children can't go to school um, and their husband's lives are in danger. And so that there's, when we talk about um, anti-sexism work and when we talk about feminism, there's a whole context there um, that exists moment to moment that we have to also take into account. And so that, that's something that I um, take with me in my work a lot as well. Thank you. KJ, I know we've talked about um, some of the aspects that Olivia raised around identity um, and whether you define yourself as a feminist or a woman activist primarily or there are other 
lenses, other multiple identities that inform who you are? If you could say a word about how your identity comes together into your work. Sure. Um, I think going off of what Olivia was saying in terms of uh, our identities, in paraphrasing, as I'm, I'm taking it to me, at different moments in my life, I've had a lot of different identities. And I think our declaration of identity or identification with certain identities or groups, um, I think is uh, symptomatic of, um, and it, it's telling of the context, right? Um, as, uh, for example, um, like my coworker, uh, who identifies as you know, a queer woman of color with a generic term in different uh, spaces differently, you know, uh, said at one point that I, I, I didn't know it was a thing to be gay. You know, I, now, you know, in you know, growing up actually, growing up in the hood and growing up as a woman of color in terms of how she kind of identified and, and coming into activist circles when there were so many different um, identity terms. And for me, um, indifferent as, as, a, as, a, as an immigrant, I came to this country when I was 10. Um, and also after having gone from uh, here to Utah, we had uh, immigrated to New York and then we immigrated, I mean immigrated, we moved to Utah um, and I had a whole different Chicago um, where I majored in philosophy and where I was maybe one of two women at that time in my class to be majoring in philosophy at University of Chicago, which really tends to be pretty, you know, traditional conservative institution, and being surrounded by men um, who really didn't acknowledge women's presence at all, um, especially in terms of philosophy, and then just as a feminist philosophy course was being offered, um, all the intersection of those things, during those years, my prominent, you know, that's when Oh, and, and, and that's not to say, you know, being, identifying myself as feminist, very much so during that time, that, that didn't necessarily override the other stuff. I had to constantly integrate all these identities that were part of me. And it was uh, always a time of conflict in many ways, always a time of struggle. But I think at the end of the day, um, you know, moving forward, especially getting out of college, I had to really collect kind of all the mentors and um, different people in my life who really gave me lang language to what I was experiencing. Um, and to be honest, in terms of my experiences, there, there are two primary mentors um, who I always say gave me the ability to critically reflect on, think about, and articulate what I was experiencing. And um, both of those people were I say were and are, were because one of them passed away, um, are African-American, um, African-American male, African-American female. And, and that kind of my social consciousness, that's who really kind of raised me in, in my formation. So my identities varied throughout my years. Um, and then I think as uh, coming to this work, it's kind of brought everything to the fore. So one of the reasons why I'm interested in the identity piece is we're talking about generational issues is um, for a couple of reasons, right? The generation Y is the most diverse generation of the four in American society today. As Malia said, the minorities will become the majority um, in the not too distant future. Um, there's a filmmaker named Lacey Schwartz who talks about when she was applying to college and it said to check her box of ethnicity, she wanted to check the box that said outside the box because of her multiple identities of being African American and Jewish and trying to figure out which box she fit in left her sort of outside of those boxes. So um, I think also for the opportunities, right, I work mostly in the, um, I started my work mostly in the Jewish community uh, with Andrea and Charles Bronfman Philanthropies six years ago and realized that the, in the Jewish community, the baby boomers and the traditionalists understood that being Jewish was their primary identity. It defined the neighborhoods they could live in and how they voted, who their friends were. Um, so as they were coming up, that was the primary identity, where for Gen Xers and Gen Yers, we have much more unfettered access as Jews to American society and can choose more openly where we get to go to college or the clubs we get to join or who we get to marry. And so the multiple identities um, I think uh, for Gen X and Gen Y, how you integrate them into yourself and into your work um, much more informs who we are as activists and is a theme that I just want to sort of underscore for today. It would be interesting to hear in the Q&A from 
um, other people in the room, especially baby boomers and traditionalists, if this transition to multiple identities comes into play for you, if you define yourself as primarily a feminist or bringing, could bring multiple identities into your work, would love to hear more about it. Um, so let me just uh, turn to Aijen. You talked about sort of the policy change that you felt was needed in your work and how to get at root causes. And um, I'm interested if you could talk a little bit more about the kinds of change you think we need to see in society and sort of what are those leverage points if we're starting to bring about a new, a new paradigm, if we're now moving from past into present and the future, what are the, the root causes that, of injustice that we need to change today? Well, um, the workforce that I organize in is, um, is all predominantly women of color. And it's mostly immigrant women who are working here, who've come here because of the changes in the global economy and the ways that their home countries have been affected by globalization, um, creating uneven development and a lot of unemployment and poverty or displacement from land and traditional forms of work. Um, and so they're here because they're searching for ways of supporting their families and for offering their, their next generations a better future. Um, and then what they come to is uh, workforces like the domestic work industry where their work isn't protected, it's not valued, and uh, there's, no, uh, there's no labor regulation and uh, even organizing isn't protected as workers and basic human rights aren't respected. And so it's a really good lens um, into looking at the kind of change that we need to see in this world because as working class immigrant women of color, there's no separating race from gender, from class, from immigration. Um, and, and it shows us the way in which all of those things are so integrated um, and the ways in which different forms of oppression are fundamentally dependent on each other and tied to each other. So you can't actually separate out what the women's movement needs to do from what the racial justice movement needs to do from what the queer liberation movement needs to do. It's actually one, uh, one enormous uh, entangled uh, oppressive system that needs actually the cohesion and the integration of all these movements for change. Um, and I think that that is most clear every day in the lives of domestic workers, but also can be clear in all of our lives if we just kind of peel it um, in different ways. And so I think that what we need to see is actually a, a massive movement um, like what we've seen in past generations that was described earlier and, um, and more, where there's actually a role for everyone. Uh, there's no shortage of roles for people in the movement, but where actually working class women of color play a really central role because of the lens and the clarity that they can bring to that interconnection of systems of oppression. And so for us, um, we actually believe that we need to start bringing these, these movements and these activities and these actions and these sectors together. And one really important way that that can happen is actually through culture and cultural exchange. Um, but I think that we need to start figuring out how we, how we converge and how we integrate our different struggles and start to see the connections. And then we need to look at ways in which we can support the leadership of working class women of color to be able to help guide and teach and um, support and organize um, and, and to really highlight the integration of these, these root causes that really need to be uprooted in order for us to see the world we want to see. So that's Could you I'm... go one step further? I know you work in a multi-generational space too. Mm -hmm. You've talked a little bit before about how the women are working together for a common goal. Can you describe a little bit? Are there generational differences? Do you do not see those differences? How do they support one another or collaborate, to use your word? Right. Well, 
most of the women in, in Domestic Workers United are between the ages of 35 and 65. Um, they're domestic workers and there is a tremendous amount of um, generational sort of solidarity and, and respect. Um, and a, largely there's a lot of cultural bonds um, that people share. We, we do a lot of um, things to build community and build understanding across generations internal to the organization. But I think that I've also been fortunate in being able to find mentors in the women's movement and in different movements, uh, women of color, activists who have really reached out um, and been available for, um, for young organizers like myself to actually talk to and get advice from and, and freak out to and vent to and, um, and who have said that, okay, this is actually all normal and don't worry. And, um, so I think it's a, a combination of just always trying to reach out intergenerationally, but also building in a culture where different generations are always interacting and, and uh, actually doing common work together, organizing together, planning events together, cooking together, talking and telling stories together. Thank you. KJ, did you want to add something? So you're uh, well, actually, you know, something that I wanted to build on when Malia was talking about paradigm shift um, overall, just to kind of just share some like on the ground, real life, real time kind of um, examples of how we take on some of our, um, our challenges of paradigm shift. I mean, when you talk about paradigm shift in terms of crime and punishment, that's like a huge area of challenge to say the least. And one of the first questions that we used to get, and, and this is, I'm getting to that question. One of the first questions that we used to get when we say no more prisons before we got into the long rigmarole of stuff, and we've gotten better at kind of um, our rigmaroles or how, to, how, how we engage people, but it was obviously like the first one, well, what do you do with all the murderers, rap rapists, and serial killers, and blah, blah, blah. That's the first line that we get most of the time, okay? And I'm sure everyone's wondering this right now, what is the answer? So my, my short answer is that we don't have a one-line answer. but. Um, you know, over the years, you know, at first we went into this lengthy kind of statistical, like every talking point, let's, let's get, these are the major kind of points that we want to convey in terms of how to break this down, right? I can give you statistics upon statistics, I can give you different policy reports, different and whatnot. But really at the end of the day, um, in, in obviously we have internally our, our separate space to really troubleshoot this and build with each other, just because we're all in one organization, and when I say we all, we're talking about three to four people right now. We went from eight person staff to three to four person staff. It's not like we're all on the same page at all, right? But, and I'll, I wanna talk about the importance of initiating that dialogue space, especially in this technological day and age. But now, do you know how we engage that question? And I would engage it right now with this audience. It's much easier to say murderers and rapists and serial killers right now when we talk about the prison system, right? But if your brother or your sister or your mother or your father, right, murder somebody, just imagine for a moment that you found out that someone in your family committed a heinous act of crime. With the first line of question, right, I could actually go through the steps and like imagine your sister, Imagine your mother, imagine for a second, you found out about this, let's say even in the past or even now. Would the first line of question that you ask, would that be, oh my God, what happened to this murderer? Right? What would be the first line of question that you would come up with? What happened to so-and-so, fill in the blank, in light of the person that you know very well, in all the complexity, the, the, the utter confusion, right? In all the complexity of that person's humanity, you would be asking that question, right? And where did I go wrong or what did I do? Or you start thinking about how did I contribute to that or how did we let this happen? And that's very much the kind of on a national level, if I were to kind of zoom that out, on a national level when Columbine shooting happened, very much the way in which society at large, and I'm talking generically, took ownership of what happened. Where did we go wrong with these children, with our children, right? And I remember like 60 minute specials in terms of psychoanalysis and, and where did we go wrong and taking ownership of this, right? Where, where did we fail? What are the signs that we missed? And just legislatively in terms of uh, policy wise, how it translated, following those school shootings is when a lot of these um, policies that went into effect that really took, 
to, it got implemented in the urban schools. So now in New York City, what we have as the Impact Schools Initiative, where you have armed police officers in schools, is a direct result of a lot of the school violence and school shooting stuff that went into effect and has an after effect. Okay. So I think when we talk about paradigm shifts, just in terms of as an organization from our experience, I, I think my point in trying to say that is this uh, on two levels. I think we need to be more descriptive rather than prescriptive. It's much easier to have neat theories or um, uh, approaches or, or whatnot in terms of addressing something. But at the end of the day, how we're going to change in our day-to-day -day, um, interaction with each other and, and, and changing notions of who those people are in different spaces, I want to encourage everyone to really initiate those dialogue spaces or whatever spaces you're in. At the end of the day, the confrontation of or interacting ideologies, it happens through us. So the more, when you talked about diversity of identities, you're going to have an understanding of all these isms in light of human interaction with other people who embody that identity. So the more we, the more we kind of brave ourselves out of the comfort zone, whatever spaces you initiate, and I think this is a perfect example of that, in in making sure who sits at the table matters and the kind of identities and experiences that are present at that moment matters. That's the only way in which we're really going to truly understand, not in, not in gender studies courses through text upon text, <laughs> you know, not, in, not through yet another study. Those things are good to know to get the lay of the land, but in our day to day, it's gonna be, you know, we are the ones that's going to bring that understanding. I want to ask the panelists another question and then invite you all to um, ask questions yourselves. So I'm just giving you a little heads up if you want to formulate your, your questions. But I want to pick up on this theme of technology we've heard a couple of you mention. Um, and if, in fact, uh, you do think that the, the advent of social networking and blogging and webinars and all of these things, um, even online campaign um, petitions, et cetera, are fueling your work? Are they a part of your work at all? Maybe not. I'm curious to know sort of the reality of technology and how it plays out in your Gen X and Gen Y activism. So I actually, I kind of wish Malia didn't have to leave to make her flight because she is way more articulate than any of us are about this. And she uses it a lot in her work. But um, I guess I would say that two things. One is that some of what I do is actually to try and combat the what technology does. Like we try and actually get people into theaters to be together. Um, and and so when people, you know, can just see stuff on the internet or go to a movie, that makes us a little bit sad. But but I do think that there but I look at my sister, for instance, who's eighteen, um, and she feels like she is a part of something online, you know, and, and I, I, I can't question that. Like it really, it's really real for her and she connects with people and she signs petitions and she looks at activist websites. I mean, she really, that is a way in which she engages the world in, in a very real way. Um, so I think my answer would be that I think I have a lot to learn. Um, and I think that there are probably really, really, really good ways of using the internet and, and that kind of technology that we haven't totally found or mastered yet. Um, but, it, but I think it's important and I think that it is, you know, a huge shift um, societally that we haven't really begun to take the measure of or the temperature of yet that it, you know, it's, it's easy to just sort of keep going along and every day there's something new and, and that transition is not stark to us because we're in it every day, but then we take a step back and, and look 20 years behind us and there's this profound difference. Um, and I think that that is real and that that's something that we have not quite come to terms with or grappled with yet. It's coming. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. Ajahn, do you want to add anything? Sure. Um, I think the corporate control of the media has been such a powerful tool in really preventing people from seeing what's really going on in so many places and so many pockets of the world. And so I think that for, like, for example, for domestic workers, it's sort of this very highly visible, invisible workforce. Or everybody sees the nannies pushing the strollers on the streets, but nobody really thinks about it and then as a, as 
as workers who have a struggle, who really face a lot of challenges in the workplace, like that is certainly not visible. And so to be able to utilize new media to actually show the work that goes into taking care of kids every day and cleaning homes and taking care of the elderly is actually really powerful. So we just discovered all this stuff <laughs> really behind the times. We need like a generation next, um, panel next. But um, we have a MySpace page and we just put up a bunch of things on YouTube and we've got a blog that's active around the Bill of Rights campaign and we've started to use the website more. Um, it's a multilingual website and we've been able to connect with domestic workers around the world through that website. Um, so it's, we're, we're starting to use it and we're realizing how powerful it really, really is. And I uh, think for us it's any and all tactics and definitely feel like the media is underutilized. So we really want to get on that. <laughs> New tools. So if we're having trouble translating, we can understand. <laughs> Older generations may be slower on the uptake as well. So, mm -hmm. KJ, did you want to add how you're using technology and then we'll take questions from the audience? I mean, you know, briefly, I would say there's so many facets of technology, both positive and negative. And I think the important thing here is to, um, again, kind of continuing on my theme of get descriptive and talk specifically about in what context, you know, does it have power? And in what context does it also create illusions um, of X, Y, Z? I mean, for us, for example, you know, there's a way in which technology has um, had, you know, varying degrees of impact. Um, on the one hand, for example, right now, in some ways, um, uh, if you would call it technology, I guess, um, one of our campaigns is um, we formed recently. We formed a task force on racial disparity to address the the uh, what the system calls disproportionate minority confinement in the juvenile justice system. This is a system term used by the federal government. We call it racial disparity. But you can talk about it until you're blue in the face, but you have to document it in terms of how is this happening and how do we change it? So by numbers. So on the one hand, one of the ways in which we've been able to do this is doing the kind of data collection and analysis. We have done a system mapping, for example, each step of the way of from arrest to what's the next step, what step. We're collecting what data we have available in terms of race, ethnicity, gender, and uh, geography and offense for who's going through the system and how, how are they going to the next stage by what factors, what decision-making process. All that is a very complicated technical process in terms of um, data gathering. And part of what enables us to do a lot of that also is the data system development that has happened, right? So we're going to literally map out, right? the what a lot of people say, oh, that's just kind of rhetoric, you're liberal, whatnot. We're going to map out how it happens, right? On the other hand, because of the developing data systems, I don't know if you guys know, under um, Bloomberg, there's real-time Crime Center now, in terms of the data bank of how things get expedited. Um, there's, and I won't get into the details of it, but you know, you have a, a, a really, uh, everything from precarious to dangerous effects like happening by virtue of these developed data systems being utilized by the criminal justice system um, that turns a blind eye to a lot of different um, factors. So, and, and, then, and then I always talk about you know, the coffee shops. Nowadays, you know, we don't really have as much organic spaces to, to converse. You, know, you walk into a coffee, space, you know, coffee shop and everyone's behind a laptop, myself included. And, you know, and the kind of the you know, kind of your your struggle of trying to get people to kind of get out of that mode. So I think that you know, rather than debating in this kind of dichotomy of good or bad, I think if we can get really, um, if we can sink our teeth into being real about the conversations around where it has been, as much as we talk about the, uh, yeah. But you know, Malia would talk about some of the ways in which I'm on the executive committee for the Gathering for Justice and the way in which we've been able to bring together the national, um, e everyone coming from all over the country, the way in which we've been able to really move this, and it took a long time with best technology that we have, with conference calls and whatnot. But I think it also brought, so while that enables that, it also makes us realize how precious it is and how really, at the end of the day, real work goes on in terms of our um, connection and our like bearing up testimony of each other's commitment 
really happens face to face. So it highlights on both ends the possibility and feasibility that it allows, as well as what the limitations are as well. Thank you. So we're eager to hear your questions or your comments over here. If you could just tell us your name too as you're introducing yourself, we'd appreciate it. I'm Judy. I'm Judy Lee, and I have a question for Kyung Ji. I was wondering if you publish that analysis that you do, and um, if so or if not, could you tell us why? Publish which analysis? The analysis of the um, actually, there's a preliminary, it's not preliminary, there's a fiscal um, version of it that Independent Budget Office actually put out um, just in December of 2007. Um, very much like they, they put a price tag per step, per, you see the flow chart per square has a, so it's cost $520 to arrest somebody, for example. Um, so they do that breakdown. The easiest way in which we do this breakdown is by dollar signs, right? And that's usually tends to be the primary impetus. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that template, the dollar sign template, and we're going to add the other data that we have available, and of course, the, the biggest hurdle, as much as this is public information, the biggest hurdle is not only getting the data from the probation department, the different agencies, and the police, but it's what we're finding out is that people are not keeping it in the same format, right? And they're not keeping track of it. So our, <laughs> we're just trying to get them to actually keep track of the race, ethnicity, gender, geography, and offense, which we think is like the basic thing. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Please, Elizabeth. Yeah, hi, Elizabeth Sackler. I have a question. Um, as we're all hoping and looking forward to and participating in, I think, um, a paradigm shift, and at, you know, perhaps with the ultimate goal of outright revolution from where we're sitting, how given, and I think I'm, I don't know, I pose it to all of you, but it came up in my mind when Olivia was talking about your younger sister and use of her, the internet and that real world for her in the virtual world. How can that happen? How do we have a paradigm shift online? And I don't mean literally a paradigm shift online, but I mean, if, if everybody is immersed, if so many people are increasingly immersed in a virtual world, how do we make a real change? I think it's a real problem. Um, I, you know, I think it is, it is easy to tune out and feel like you're still doing something, right? I get emails all the time that like, if I click on this link, a dollar is going to go to breast cancer research and I click and I'm like, oh, I did a really good thing today. And I didn't, really. Um, so I think, I think that's certainly the danger, but I think um, what KJ is talking about, the, the potential to bring people together who might not otherwise be able to come together. So for instance, um, you know, the work we do with Emancipate, we have seven artists around the country and we can't afford to fly them all to New York for a meeting every month but we need to keep them in touch and, and there are ways in which we're able to use technology to make that happen. And so I think, you know, and that's different from Facebook, right? There's this whole other Facebook, MySpace, um, social networking thing that I think is, I like hearing from people that I went to middle school with, but I, I don't think it's gonna help me be a better activist. Um, so, you know, I think, I think, I guess my answer is that it, there, I don't know what the answer is, but I do think it's something that we need to be grappling with um, and figuring out how to use better and and figuring out how to keep sacred the space that we have together physically as well. Um, you know, so coming to places like this to be together, I think is is going to continue to be crucial. I also wonder what it's a symptom of. You know, I um, I, I think that there. Are, uh, four generations trying to sit around the same leadership tables at the same time, and there's not often enough space created to incorporate all of those voices. So um, hearing from millennials that they can contribute a dollar through Facebook causes that goes to an issue and direct money to an issue without having to join a board because they wouldn't even know how to access it, 
um, or um, ha you know, sign a petition because they know when they add up the collective power of that might go to create change. You know, in some ways I wonder if the, the technology allows younger people to participate in civic life in a way that they wouldn't have been able to access previously. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's, a, you know, I do think it's a problem. It's hard to think about how to create these paradigm shifts online, but I also wonder what's missing that's so attractive to them that they're going online. I just wanted to say, um, maybe I wasn't clear, I didn't, I guess I didn't, I don't really expect that there is a way to do it online. I guess it really has to do with my belief that we have to be present in real time in order to create paradigm shifts or revolutionary changes. And if so many people are increasingly glued to isolated uh, interactions, how are we going to start to work together in real time? I think we need to watch what's happening um, online with, with younger people. I mean, I think that's certainly my prejudice against the internet too, right? How do we do anything if we're not together? But I think, um, I think there's, there's wisdom there that we don't necessarily totally understand and that we, rather than saying this is a problem that we need to solve, I think we, we are better off saying this is something we don't yet totally understand and there are young people who seem to and to watch what that is and to try and learn from it and, and maybe guide it um, is, is where I would go with it. The move on, the money that's been raised through move on and uh, directed even specifically the Obama campaign is to something that we could maybe look at and learn from, you know, and it's it's been the vehicle. While they haven't physically come together, really, they've, a generation has come together and had a voice in that particular part of the election. Also, you know, what I was going to say is, you know, if we could look at it as, if we could downplay it a little bit and look at it as, as much as it's been phenomenal, and I think there's been a lot of, you know, discussion and hype around it by virtue of, um, and legitimately so, but I think especially now that we have a couple of decades under our belt to kind of look at it critically, as we are doing now, I think if we could look at it as a new tool rather than a new frontier, in just in terms of framing it, um, and also as much as you know, um, I guess it's kind of a, a, an analogy, you know, I instead of instead of saying you know, instead of trying to censor it out, you have to you have to look at <laughs> you know how it is how it is being used in the part of whoever we're trying to reach. So. For us, as much as you know, as much as we like, you know, uh, moan and grunt at the way in which MySpace has like taken over in, in some of the interactions and whatnot, we've also, when we were running our PMP training academy, which is for young people ages 8, 14 to 18, so you could imagine kind of how technology um, has been playing out. We just really have to take a step back and let's really look at exactly how it is and why it is playing out the way it is in their lives and then integrate it and use it as a tool, as a pedagogical tool as well. So not just a, you know, not just a, you know, let's take a, uh, you know, um, demographic kind of survey of how they use it, but let's, let's look at how this is going to be a real, um, uh, like integrative, you know, tool in our like kind of pedagogy of how we're working with them. So I think if we can put in that perspective, the way in which we look at it, the way in which we approach and use it would be a little different. And we saw a few more hands. Sarah, did you have a question? Uh, Sarah Gould. Um, I, I'm interested that you are uh, all working, that none of you, although s some of you come closer than others, but none of you is working in what might be called, you know, from the baby boomer generation, a, a women's organization. And so the, um, the, the networks that you come into contact with, um, are, I think, women and men like yourselves who are doing organizing with women, uh, but not from, an, uh, not from a women's organization uh, place. So what my question is, do you find, um, do you find kindred spirits? Uh, one of the things we're, one of the notions that the Ms. Foundation and Third Wave, Australia, some other organizations, a wider group of organizations have been working with is um, feminist social justice. 
So, uh, which comes from this experience of being in many rooms with people who are doing social justice work and oftentimes from a very deep race and class analysis, but not from a very deep gender analysis. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, your experience in your networks, do you find that there is a strong gender race class analysis or not? And what are your thoughts about that? Do you want me to say? Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> I think that there is not a strong gender race class analysis uh, in, in most spaces. I think it, there's always one or two uh, frames or lenses that get sacrificed. And, um, and I think that there is still, sadly, uh, a level of sexism that's very prevalent within the social justice movement and a way in which um, uh, gender and sexism it is rarely talked about, uh, let alone patriarchy as a system of oppression. And so I think it's really important that we actually play a role as feminists um, in the social justice movement, that we actually organize and we actually push for there always, always, always to be a gender analysis and perspective. And there has to be a campaign around that. It, it doesn't just happen um, because you say it should. There, it, it has to be a real deliberate strategy. Um, and I would say that depending on which space you're in, it, it's also a question of a race analysis is missing in a lot of spaces, and, and that and race and class analysis um, can often be missing in a women's movement space. And so I think it's like uh, trying to figure out as we move into the future, how do we quickly read what's the internal campaign that needs to happen in any given space, and then find ways of organizing that campaign to actually, to actually move forward. And I think the lens of feminist social justice or social justice feminism is really helpful because it really names the integration that I was talking about of these different parts of the movement into one uh, framework and and I think that integration is going to be key to how we move forward and to really address the root causes um, I guess one one quick anecdote I would share is that we uh, we had a lot of questions come to us in terms of do you guys have a gender specific program um, working with young women um, in the system and whatnot um, it's been a long long uh, discussion and, and, and sharing of, of, of different experiences. One of the things that we had um, identified in terms of looking at the landscape was, uh, well, we identified other allies who were doing um, it, well, organizationally, institutionally, programmatically, very gender specific stuff. But in the course of discussing this, we also made observations among many in, in terms of us. Notice that in our organization, we have a very strong women leadership. Um, especially in the second half of the organizational development. And there's something to be, <laughs> that a lot of young women, what, what we were bringing up was that we are, because the vast majority of the um, people getting locked up are men and young men, um, that assumption is that this is a kind of uh, men of color issue, so to speak. And, and there's definitely, there's been all kinds of interesting dynamics and, and, and interactions as, um, as we come um, to different spaces. And by virtue of that, without getting into all the different stories, by virtue of that, in that interaction and confrontation, actually, I think has been a lot of paradigm shift in terms of what, um, on, from perception on both sides. So there's been that, and, and we've been trying to actually take that to a different level, but um, just programmatically speaking, nonprofit institutional landscape, we're like, we, we partner up with them. Um, there was someone, the lady in the red jacket down here has a question. And then back. Got you. Oh. Hello. It, this is more of a comment on the paradigm shift. From where I sit, I'm 37 now. The shift has already happened. These spaces that these young children 
conversant or real to them. Um, the feminist sites, even the VR game environments from Warcraft, Second Life, um, EVE Online, they are real spaces to them. And the old notion of coffee shops is gone. It's never coming back. We have to learn how to deal with these spaces as reality. And I don't know if at my age or anybody my age can do that. It's really up to them to harness that power. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for our reality check. Um, I will, if I, when I figure out how to create an avatar on Second Life, I'll meet you there. <laughs> There's a gentleman in the back with a question. Thanks for your patience. Well, we're videotaping, if you don't mind. Thank you. So I'm going to be recorded in my scattered question. It fell apart, actually. So um, I guess I'd have, uh, my name's Terrence. I, first of all, appreciate you all for creating this space to use one of the, the words we use, paradigm shift space. So um, I guess, uh, first of all, I arrived about a half an hour late, so I didn't really get to hear uh, if um, feminism was sort of defined or if anyone attempted for themselves to make um, clear what they mean when they invoke the term feminism. Um, I guess for me that comes to mind in light of the fact that uh, I'm a graduate student, spend time talking about high theory, and the spaces in which I have these conversations about gender, it strikes me as um, men being quite often some of the most strident feminists depending upon how you define feminism. And I'm, I'm not exaggerating when I say that, like it, it's uh, perhaps going back to what I, Olivia was saying with respect to coming from, if, if, if you're in an Ivy League institution, odds are you had a very privileged background, and if you're a female, um, same goes. Therefore, uh, for ha perhaps for fem females who end up in those spaces, they don't quite identify with the feminist label as much, and so men having encountered some of the criticisms of gender may be more conscious of um, those concerns and therefore try, uh, go out of the way, in fact, to be feminist, so to speak. And so I was just wondering very um, quickly whether anyone would define feminism and whether you would comment uh, on what you think the role of men are in gender analysis. You said, someone said, I don't recall who, that it was going to be critical to have uh, poor women, particularly poor women of color, domestic women in, in leadership positions. Um, that that was sort of, in and of itself, uh, a necessity if we were going to have progress. And I wonder if that's not true as well with respect to men being included in the conversations of this kind. Um, and then the, I guess the second thought that I had uh, was sort of like the irony that we're meeting at the Brooklyn Museum of Art in light of the fact that we're commenting about oppressed people. And oppressed people, I think, probably are least likely to have avatars to be uh, on Second Life. So the paradigm shift that's occurred has certainly not occurred for those people. Uh, quite frankly, in the neighborhood that I live in Philadelphia, you probably have like one house out of ten with people with the internet in their house. So uh, we have to be conscious, conscious of context when we talk about uh, technology and its impact upon people's lives. And so I was wondering if we could just, in light of this scrambled question, um, comment upon it as you see fit. Thank you. So I heard defining feminism, the role of men in feminist spaces, technological access to low-income people. So I think I definitely appreciate the, the comment about technology. I think that that's important to remember as we think about organizing tools. Um, I would imagine we all have different I, definitions of feminism. I think my favorite is the bumper sticker. Um, feminism is the radical notion that women are people. And I think for me it's as simple as that, right? Like feminism is the idea that we are all equal, period. That's it. And I think some of the complexity comes in when we get into the like, oh, but feminists are these bra burning, men hating, you know, people who are other than me. Um, but I think it, for me the definition is as simple as that. Um, and I think that you know, in my own particular experience, men have been some of the strongest feminists in my life. Um, and I think I've been lucky enough to be in organizing circles where that's the case. But I would also say that, um, particularly working in the theater, there's a phenomenon of, of 
organizations led by men that are held up by young women. Um, and I think that that often tends to be the case in, in older activist organizations as well. Um, I don't know this is, if this is a direct answer to your question, but I think that... <laughs> well, I guess I would just say that I think it's very obvious that men need to be part of the conversation as well. I mean, it's not, because we're talking about social justice organizing, we're talking about people working together um, and not about bubbles. Um, because I'm conscious of the hour, I, I would ask, um, and because we're organizers and activists, if you want to just say, like, two words about next steps that you would give the audience as you're leaving. Sort of what are the, what are the next steps that they might take from this conversation out into the world? Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I have here <laughs> flyers. <laughs> On Saturday, June 7th, this coming Saturday, there's going to be a huge march for the Domestic Workers Bill of Rights. Um, at City Hall at 11 a.m. and your presence will make a world of difference in the lives of over 200,000 women who do this work who are fighting for basic labor rights. So if you can please come out, um, get brunch and do whatever you gotta do in the morning, but show up at City Hall at 11 on Saturday, June 7th. Um, and yeah, we'd really appreciate it. I have flyers here. I've also got postcards and stickers to support the Bill of Rights. And if you're interested in getting involved, our website is www.domesticworkersunited.com, uh, .org. And, uh, um, and you can also email us through the website. Thanks. I would like a sticker. <laughs> um, I, I think I would like to encourage everyone to talk to someone who is not their age about all this stuff. So if you're uh, an, an older feminist, find a younger feminist to mentor, and if you're a younger feminist, go learn from someone. And it could be a man, or it could be a woman, and it could be a puppy. An avatar. <laughs> an avatar. Yeah, I'm gonna build on both points, and I would, I would put in an extra plug for Aijin's um, event. Part of it also is in light of what we're talking about. I know that you go, we all go to a lot of these panels and conferences or whatnot and, and it's like, you know, kind of for the moment and we have best intentions and I think we kind of get absorbed back into our own kind of um, everyday lives. But I do think that if we are going to talk about anything, paradigm shift, all that stuff at the end of the day comes down to kind of everyday initiatives. And you, no matter how much you hear about it from people, domestic workers united to whatever, you know, it, this is one of many different things, but you're not going to get that perspective unless you're present. So I think that, that presence, even for those of us like activists, we get jaded and we're like, oh God, no, I'm doing this, I don't need to go to you know, certain rallies or whatnot. But I think it's important for us to really put, put ourselves to task in terms of applying ourselves in different modes of being and relating to each other. So on that note, I would just encourage everyone to try to get push yourselves outside of the box and kind of identify what different modes of learning and being you can um, kind of initiate. Um, so that's, that's my last note. So I see Dr. Sackler wants to do the close. Um, before we do, I just want to thank you all for being here and thank our panelists, thank you, Ajahn Poo, Olivia Greer, Kian Lee, and Malia Lazu. And thank you for hosting us at the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. Thank you very much. Um, I really do hope, and I thank you all for being here and uh, sharing your wisdom and your smarts and your activism. And I, I hope that we can continue this approach, this dialogue, and um, that we all begin to, to work and move together in wonderful, important ways um, that have begun. I'd like to thank the Ms. Foundation and 2164 for co-sponsoring this event for the center. And um, also to let you know that Christina Biaggi, who is an artist, is going to be doing a talk. The title of her talk is The Inspiration, <coughs> excuse me, The Inspiration of Activism in Art. And it will be in the center uh, in the forum on June 15th. And Christine Quinn, who is speaker uh, of city council, is going to be 
uh, here in this auditorium for the Elizabeth A. Sackler uh, Wildcard, uh, speaking on Health Starts With You, which is her initiative in the city for especially um, uh, women who do not have easy access to health care and how, how important that is and what is available. So uh, I'd like to invite you to join us down in the Hall of the Americas for a small reception and opportunity to uh, speak to our panelists and to our moderator and to one another. And I thank you very much for coming. Thank you very thank you. much, Sharna, and thank you panelists very much. Yeah.